This is my sister's experience. Now, my sister is 22 years old, married, and has a very small child. They live in a beautiful four-bed, two-bathroom house. But, the only downside is there is a trailer park, basically in their front yard. She and her husband had lived in their home about a year when the incident occurred. Kelsey, my sister, is absolutely gorgeous. Blonde hair, tall, thin, and all-around pleasant. She has had a stalker problem in the past, which I'll ask if I can share at a later time, but this one experience beats all of them. She had just put the baby down for a nap and needed to get some work done in the yard, so she grabbed the baby monitor, locked the house, and proceeded to go to the yard and do some weeding. She is a very, very paranoid person, so she's always aware of her surroundings. As she was tending to her garden, she noticed something in the corner of her eye. There was a man about 200 feet away, just standing in the middle of the trailer park, staring right at her. She quickly turned back to her duties and brushed it off. However, she did try to keep her in her peripherals. After a few minutes, she got a chilling feeling that he moved closer. As she suspected, he was now at the stop sign which was 100 to 125 feet away from her. She described him as standing in the normal anatomical stance, feet shoulder width apart, palms facing forward or facing her, blank stare, etc. Kelsey, pretending not to see him, carried on, but this time moved to the garbage bins to dispose of the weeds. As she headed towards the bins, she caught him moving closer to her, they both made eye contact, so she was 100% sure that he saw her, and she wouldn't be able to play this one off. At this point, she's 80 feet away from him. It's a 15-foot sprint to the house, also realizing that she has to unlock the door as well, which will give him time to catch up to her. The moment she begins to run, he sprints towards her. She made sure that she had her key ready before she made her mad dash for the house. So she got in at about the time he was on the front porch. As soon as she slammed the door and locked it, he turned away and trekked back into the glum trailer park. Kelsey called her husband, who then came rushing home, then called the cops. The man described was never found. She even mentioned him getting a haircut or trimming his beard, but no one in the trailer park matched any of their descriptions. Hopefully it won't happen again, but we're all keeping our fingers crossed and that maybe he's too scared to show his face again. My parents have basically been divorced all my life. So every other weekend, I would go visit my dad. He, my stepmom, and two of my stepsisters lived in a trailer, and that's where I would go for the weekend. A lot of people in the park are pretty normal, and there are a lot of people that live there. But, there are some freaking weirdos, I'll tell you. Anyways, I was probably about seven years old at the time, and one of my stepsister was around nine. We lived next door to a family, and usually hung out with a daughter in the family. Her name was Shiloh. The three of us would stay out at night until 2 a.m. God knows why our parents let us do that in a sketchy trailer park. We would also hang out at Shiloh's house a lot. Her dad was always home and he would play with us, watch TV, etc. I never thought he was one of the creepy motherfuckers of the neighborhood. There is or was a clear shot view from Shiloh's living room through our kitchen window and into my stepsister's room. Now, my stepsister had a habit of leaving doors open when she would go to the bathroom, change, etc. You can see where this is going. One day, the two of us were outside playing on the front lawn, when Shiloh's dad came walking up to us. I clearly remember him standing near us, watching, and we were looking up at him. He directly looked at my stepsister smiling and said, Hey Alex, I watched you change through your kitchen window last night. As young kids would do, we flipped the fuck out. I didn't understand at the time. I was just reacting to Alex freaking out. 
Alex ran inside crying, told our parents, and they called the cops. I don't know what happened after that exactly. Shiloh and her brother Jimmy moved to Florida to live with their grandparents, and their dad was arrested. Not exactly what for. Maybe the cops found some child pornography or something like that when they went into his house. After then, another family moved in, and that dad was arrested too. Not sure why, we weren't allowed to talk to any of the more neighbors anymore. Finally, they just took the damn cursed trailer out for good, and the lot is still empty next to their house. All in all, Shiloh and Jimmy's dad was a freaking pedo. I used to live in a trailer park. It was in decent shape at the time, mostly full of elderly people who wanted a nice but small space, cheap rent, and perhaps a garden to take care of. Relative to most trailer parks I've seen, it was large. It had what most would consider blocks, but not sidewalks. For some reason, my high school assigned a bus stop that was a five block, 20 plus minute walk even though there was a stop closer to my residence. I lived on the main road, but toward the back. It started out straight from the front and made a big swooping curve, like a pirate's hook, toward the back corner, which is closest to where I was. For reference, approximately 70 to 80 trailers fit on this main road. All of the side streets branched off this road into an NS version of the same name. The first stop for the school bus was the one that I was assigned. Before I ventured through the whole trailer park, so I'm still confused as to why my stop was all the way toward the front when the bus had to pass my actual trailer anyway. It was a classic western New York winter Monday, early 2008 and I began my walk 30 minutes before my pickup time. The roads had some ice, but were not completely iced over. Instead of following the full curve toward the front of the trailer park, I usually went down my friend's street and walked the remaining five blocks worth toward the front. It was on this street that a car pulled out of a driveway and began driving in my direction. I'm unsure which trailer it belonged to, but it was within two doors down range from my friend's house. My friend used to walk with me, but at this point, I don't think we were close anymore, since I would have waited for her otherwise. It wasn't unusual for a car in the trailer park to be driving at 6.30 a.m., but since it was winter, it was still dark as nighttime. However, it was weird that the car didn't just pass me. If you're up that early, don't you have somewhere to be or better things to do than tail high schoolers on the way to their bus stop? They were following me at a slow pace at about five to 10 miles per hour, if that. I was a fast walker in general, but it's not like I was walking faster than a normal idling car speed. It didn't help that I had my French horn with me since that got pretty heavy after a while and wouldn't have made the best weapon in the hands of a 14 year old 5 7 120 pound female with no prior self defense training. I've corrected that since though. I got that bad gut feeling as soon as I realized the car was idly stalking rather than passing by. The car's distance from me varied, sometimes they'd be a block back and others they'd be right behind me. But. Never did the driver's side window end up level to where I was, nor did the driver say anything. I also kept looking back frequently, since the car wasn't very loud, so as to make sure the driver hadn't just parked it and gotten out to swipe me, or whatever their plan was. I think this made it obvious that I was aware of their presence. They tailed me for a while before pulling off into a side street and disappearing. Probably when they knew I was heading toward a bus stop populated with other kids, or perhaps they were looking for a less wary target. To this day, I have no idea who it was, if they lived there, or if it was just someone hanging out waiting for someone to creep on. I was more focused on moving quickly toward the bus stop than stopping to check the license plate. Like I said, the car wasn't always right there, and I don't have the best vision anyway. This only happened once. That afternoon I mentioned to the lady who drove the bus that a creep had followed me that morning and asked if she would be able to pick me up directly at my house from that point on. For the remainder of the time I lived there, she obliged, as did most substitute bus drivers, even though it wasn't officially on their list. Sometimes I'm a little road ragey with buses, but when I remember my incident, 
I'm no longer mad that kids get dropped off right at home now, at least where I live. It may be annoying, but at least they're safe. So I didn't exactly grow up rich. And for a brief time, my mom and I lived in a trailer park when I was around the age of eight. I spent a lot of time outside, always riding my bike. I rode through some parts of the neighborhood, and every day passed this same old woman's house. She was very skinny and had crazy frizzy black hair, and was always outside watering her lawn with the hose. One day, I'm playing in the living room, right next to the front door. She knocks and I answer. She told me that she locked her keys in her house and she needed me to climb through the window to get them for her because she can't fit. I sweetly tell her that I need to ask my mom first. She starts to argue but I tell her I just needed to make sure. I leave the door open and head to the very back room to the trailer to ask if my mom if it was okay. I explain to her exactly what the lady said and I actually wanted to help. Understandably so, my mother leaps up and heads down the hall. Just as the old woman begins to head through our door, she yells at her to get the hell out, and that's that. Whenever I tell this story to people, they always tell me that I'm overthinking, but I really think this woman was trying to do something to me. I think she would have kidnapped me or something even worse if I had a gun with her. I don't think you can ever overthink a situation like that. When I was 14, I used to hang out with my friend Tony who lived in a trailer park. We used to spend time around a couple cute girls, one of which I was interested in. She was 13. For the sake of not divulging names, I will call them Carrie, the one I liked, and Hope. One day, I went to see if Carrie wanted to hang out, and she wasn't home. So Tony and I mosey over to Hope's house and I knock on the door. A balding man in his late 40s or 50s, opens the door after a few minute wait and points a 45 at my head. He said something in the effect, If you ever come knocking here again, I'll shoot you. I noped the hell out of there and decided I didn't like the guy or knocking on his door much anyway. Later that week, I visited my dad who worked at the mental ward at the Salem Penitentiary in Oregon, the one where One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was filmed. Somehow, the conversation over dinner drew me to casually mention, some people are so crazy, to which my dad was not thrilled to hear about that encounter. My dad asked me for the man's phone number, which I had because I also happened to have Hope's number. He called the guy, whose name was Rick, the old gunslinging creepazoid. He offered the man a place in his facility, with mention for the fact that he is allowed to fill out mandatory referral forms which upon submission require action by the recipient to evaluate their own mental health. Ricky quickly apologized and guaranteed the incident would not be repeated. Two or three days later, on a Saturday at around 8 p.m., I got the call during dinner at my mom's house where I lived. It was Rick. He apologized me profusely and wanted to make it up to me. He suggested that I come over and play a game of pool with him. Being headstrong, cocky, and far from naive child, there was some cursing, laughing, and a big old nope. Sometime later, around the period of a few weeks or a month, Rick made the front page. He had been sexually soliciting children, which I learned from other sources included Carrie and Hope, his own daughter, to older men, a female friend who was close with both girls, but overweight and apparently never targeted, mentioned to me that Rick had a giant container of vitamin E lotion and no pool table. Pool with an over-aggressive, Gun happy, creepazor, on a Saturday evening. Yeah, I, I'd rather have something else to do than spend my night with one of those people. About six years ago, 
My now husband Josh and I moved to Northern Kentucky for work. Northern Kentucky is part of a tri-state area with Ohio and Indiana. This was our first apartment that was larger than a shoebox, so we were looking for some extra counter space. We found the perfect microwave car on Craigslist, so Josh called up the seller, who seemed perfectly normal. The address was in Wren Road in Ross, which we assumed was in Kentucky. We also assumed, based off our own experiences with the waterfall property on the East Coast, that it would be a nice neighborhood, as it was right on the Ohio River. So we mapped out our route and went on our way in our Mustang convertible. With the top down, it was just getting dark outside at this point. After a considerable drive, and after passing the road by accident, we found it. In addition to the street sign, which was mostly hidden by bushes and trees, it was marked with some very faded wooded signs, which we couldn't read very well in the dark. Those signs probably should have been our first inclination that something wasn't right, but we vaguely took notice and turned down the street. Upon going over a small hill that included railroad tracks in a perpendicular to the road, we bottomed out and lost our muffler. So with our car now being extra loud, we came out of the trees into a small trailer park. There were about five trailers on each side of the road, which ended in a cul-de-sac. Immediately, we were a bit nervous. Having not expected a scene like this, Josh pulled the car in and turned it around so we were facing the exit. Immediately, the inhabitants of the trailer park, who had all been standing together talking, came over and surrounded the car. I was pretty much panicking at this point and nudging, just wanting to get out of there. The large, beer-bellied redneck man who seemed to be the spokesperson of the group asked angrily what we were doing there. Josh told him we were there for a microwave cart in Craigslist. The man said, Craigslist? Nah, we don't got nothing like that out here. What'd you say you were looking for? At this point, Josh is calling the woman he had spoken to on the phone, and there are about eight people all around the car. Luckily for us, they were not in front of the car. The woman answers the phone, and Josh realizes we're obviously in the wrong place, apologizes a few times and we floor it out of there, on the way back over the hill, and bottom out again. Speaking to the woman on the phone, we realized that she was in Wren Road in Rosh Township, Ohio. We set off for her actual residence, and claimed our microwave cart at her nice, normal suburban home. We were scared shitless and our car was even louder than normal, but we were safe. There are plenty of lessons to be learned from others who have dealt with Craigslist creeps, but we still use it when necessary, and haven't really had any actual issues since then. One lesson we did learn though, Riverfront property in the Midwest is complete opposite of beachfront property on the East Coast. I've had many paranormal experiences in my time, a lot of them way scarier than this one, but this is just one of them. I felt like I wanted to share this one first because it's pretty creepy but at the same time lighthearted. When I was young, pre-puberty aged, my grandfather lived in a trailer park that was directly next door to what was at the time a large empty field. This was when my grandfather was still active and able to do things like go for walks. So one day, he suggested that just for fun, we go for a walk to the end of the field and back. We went for a quick walk through the field, filled with tall grass and weeds, and to my surprise, there was a cemetery down the other side of it. Now being the curious kid that I was, and also having a pre-existing fascination with all things horror and supernatural, my interest was piqued. Alas, we couldn't explore it. There was a fence in the way. My grandfather and I walked back home, and along the way he joked that a ghost would follow us from the cemetery. I knew he was joking, but I also knew that he believed in spirits, as did I. So in the back of my mind, I humored the possibility that it could happen. When we got back to his trailer, I had to pee, so I went to the bathroom. I did my business like usual, and started to zip up my pants. And suddenly, the toilet lid slammed down, and I watched the handle go down right before my eyes, and the toilet flushed itself. I guess my grandfather was right. I guess a ghost did follow me home, 
and apparently, they had a sense of humor. Nobody believed me, and they still don't. But I know what I saw, and I know that it happened. During the summer, right before I turned 13, I would often use my mom's cell phone to talk to my best friend for hours. To do this, I would often go outside and sit in the car with the doors locked. I lived in a trailer park just off I-70 in Missouri at the time, and I was far enough into the park that there was a patch of trees about 200 feet from my trailer. I could see it very clearly from the front seat of my car. This particular night, I was about to hang up and head inside when I saw something odd out of the corner of my eyes right along the tree line. I tell my friend to hold on, just in case something bad was about to happen, and I can't tell you how glad I was that I did that. Down the tree line there was a shadow, human in shape, except it wasn't a human. The hair on my arm stood up, and I instantly got a headache and felt nauseous. It was running, whatever it was. The run was almost put into slow motion so it looked very similar to those old cartoon wheels when they spun slowly. There were no details, no face, no fingers, no clothes, no feet, but it stood anywhere between seven to nine feet. It vanished into the deeper shadows of the woods. Instantly, I felt a menacing pressure and eyes on me from an unknown person. I tell my friend what I just saw, and that I may be in serious trouble. I turned to my porch, which was about eight feet away from the driver's side door, which where I was sitting, and there was a thing standing directly between my porch and myself. I hear a noise down the gravel road by the woods, and I turn to see a car coming up, and I remember very distinctly saying, please stay on the line, Corey, I'm making a run for this car once it passes. As soon as I see the windshield, I was sure that there would be a witness if anything happened to me. I ran faster than I had ever ran in my life. I managed to get inside and I slept with the lights on that night. This happened to me about eight or nine years ago and I've never been able to come up with any explanations. Since you all seem to know a lot about paranormal happenings, I thought I'd share here. When I was around 10 years old, I was outside in my front yard, playing with my little sister, who was about four at the time. For the last few weeks, there had been a girl coming around the neighborhood who was kind of weird. No one had ever seen her before when she first showed up. She was about 18 and thin with long, blonde hair. We assumed she had just moved into the trailer park down the street since she always seemed to come from there and she would always come around asking to do favors for money and things like that and everyone just had a weird feeling about her. So anyways, I was outside playing with my sister on this day and my grandmother was babysitting us since my dad was at work and my mom had some errands to run. We were out playing hopscotch or something. She was walking down the street when we saw her. I turned and saw my mom walking down the street towards us. I was really confused as to why she was walking down the street and where the car was and everything. My sister stopped and stared at her too. She seemed confused as well for a second and yelled, Mommy! And started to walk towards her. This is the really strange part. Out of nowhere, my sister stopped and her smile completely faded. When I looked back at my mom, it was the weird blonde girl I mentioned before. Definitely not my mom. And there's not really any way we could have thought she was my mom from a distance because, like I said, the girl was very thin with long blonde hair. My mom is not that thin and has very short, dark brown hair. I knew it was her when I saw her, and apparently so did my sister. I remember us looking at each other and running inside, especially since my parents had told us to stay away from that girl in the first place if we ever saw her. After that happened, 
I don't remember ever seeing her again. Now I've heard of doppelgangers, and I've considered that as a possible explanation, but I've never heard of a story of someone actually transforming like that. Has anyone else ever heard of something like this happening? This one time, when I was around 13, I was living in a trailer park with my parents. Both of my parents worked the night shift at a factory, and my sister was moved out by the house by then. I don't believe in anything anymore, but I can't really explain this experience. I was alone at home, and playing video games on our oldest television. My parents had gone for the night, and they would not be back until 7 in the morning. Like any other night, I put some music on a radio, ate dinner by myself, and turned in early that evening. My parents hated it when I stayed up late due to a higher electricity bill. After my eyes closed for what felt like a second, I remember walking up and unable to breathe. I couldn't move my arms, legs, or head. I could move my eyes, and I heard this loud buzzing sound in my ears. It was almost like when very high power lights are kicked on, and then they hum. I heard a high-pitched laughter in the middle of the buzzing noise, and that was it. I couldn't hear myself trying to scream or gasp or anything. I didn't feel anything in my body at all, actually, except the pain in my chest from not having oxygen. I could dimly see my room, but it was too dark, and I couldn't really detail anything. This lasted around a minute, but it felt like forever. I simply woke up the next morning, and I was very confused about that night. I have never told anyone this story, not even my parents to this day. The reason why I never told anyone was that the dreams I had afterwards. School had started again and I largely blocked out that weird night. I can't exactly pimp out how long it had been, so I will say five munches maybe. The day that I had the dream I can't remember that clearly, but I remember the dream very well. I was sitting on a brown futon with a black frame in the dream. I was in a house with all the lights off. The walls were white and there was no other furniture and the carpet was a light brown. I was facing a wall in this room with no features. On my left and my right were normal wooden doors with square engravings on them. The room was about 20 feet wide by 25 feet long. The ceiling was plain white, I think. As well, I remember being calm in the first moments of my dream. Somehow I knew the other people that were in the house, but there were no lights on. While I was in a calm state of observation in the room, the door to my right opened up, and a tall black figure with long black dusters and black wide-brimmed hats came out, and I stepped into the room hurriedly. He crossed in front of me and out the door to my left into another room. I remember I went immediately from being calm to scared shitless. Out of fear I got up and ran after him. Usually, I would harness an emotion like anger to control being scared, but in my dream I could not. I don't know why, but I just pursued him through the door. He was stopped in what looked like to be an empty kitchen with floored ceiling windows showing a blue evening and a sizable fenced in yard outside on my right. He was staring out the window in front of me as I approached him from a very, very calm demeanor. I do not know what I meant to do in my dream but I felt like I was going to attack him despite how terrified I felt. He turned to me and raised his glove right hand up. At the same point, my feet left the ground and I felt that he was able to pick me up. He was not even physically touching me, but it was a lot like a Darth Vader force choke. I woke up not too long after that. I don't know if these things are linked. I can't explain the high-pitched laughter when I was locked up in my body, that's for sure. I have not taken the time to read through other experiences to see if anything is similar, but maybe you guys can tell me if you've ever heard of anything like that.
I just wanted to say that for one month only, I have exclusive Swamp Dweller Summer merch. You can get t-shirts and tank tops, but after that month, I will no longer print this design. I do have some new designs coming as well this summer that you can get, so be sure to jump on that and get this exclusive summer design.